a few words on who European alternatives are, who are organizing this talk. So we are a non-profit association who work to promote democracy, equality and culture beyond the nation state and imagine, demand and enact alternatives for a viable future. We often work in the intersection between politics and arts. And over the past three years, we've been working on a project called Room to Bloom, which is connecting and experimenting with eco-feminist art. In the next year of our projects, we're moving on more to think about water, um, both in an artistic direction and also in an ecological activist direction. Um, and obviously we see these combined as well. So tonight we have invited two speakers, Jenny and Michaela, and yes, Jenny is based in New York currently and is a visual artist who combines ecological activism into her work. And Nicola is currently based in Vienna. She is both an ocean rights lawyer and also an art curator, notably at the moment working with the TBA 21 Academy. I also invite you, if you would like to learn more about our project Room to Bloom, to explore our artistic digital catalogue, which I am sending to the chat now, to explore in your own time. Um, and you can find a lot of different snippets of what we've done in there, and also different texts and inspirations to the project. So first of all, I would like to pass on to Mikla Dave for her presentation. Thanks. Thank you so much for the invite, Billy, as well as the introductions. Um, I'm just going to share my screen so that everyone of you can see it. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, I hope that you can see my screen and Billy, if you can just give me a signal that you can see my screen, that's great. Um, as a uh, Billy mentioned, I'm Mikla and I'm based in Vienna. I am an ocean law and policy analyst researcher with an art foundation um, called TBA21, which is based across Madrid, Venice and Vienna. I am also uh, currently doing a PhD research um, at the University of Applied Arts Vienna um, in art history and curating. So I do have a background in law policy um, and as well as art history um, and curating academically and also quite recently in practice in curating. So I operate in both these fields uh, quite often and the way in which I operate in both these fields is from the lens of the oceans. Um, the oceans came to me um, through the aspect of me uh, really relating to water as an element um, in the way in which um, I feel water is like my guardian. Um, it's something that soothes me, calms me, and it's um, a beautiful entity in the form of the ocean um, that is vast and deep and quite mysterious to me. So um, that is the way in which I really connect with uh, the oceans. Um, and uh, I specifically work with TBA 21. Um, um, yeah, I specifically work with TBA 21 on oceans because TBA 21 really focuses on the oceans from a transdisciplinary aspect. So um, TBA 21 works with artists, curators, um, thinkers, philosophers, um, lawyers or legal analysts, researchers like me, um, as well as scientists to really think about how oceans can be protected better. 
So it's in this really um, interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary approach in which we really um, rethink the oceans themselves or itself. Um, my specific practice within TBA21 has been uh, since the past two years. And as a researcher, I've been really thinking about my own agency um, of uh, agency of protecting the oceans. How do I do that? Um, what is the way in which I can also work with TBA21 in order to bring some important discourse that strings the ocean from the impacts of climate change? And overall, how does it really um, improve in the sense of people or civil society coming together um, in the frame of a movement um, in order to protect the ocean. So there's these three key aspects that I continuously try to think about in my research um, with TBA21. This also spills um, a lot into my work um, in my PhD as well, because um, the again, the oceans are a frame of my research in my PhD. And in my PhD, I'm more concerned with the kind of relations that are formed around the oceans, specifically from the global communities, uh, global South communities, um, and also um, how rights of the oceans can be framed as well. So the ocean has its own voice and its own agency, especially from the aspect of um, artistic practices or projects and also curatorial strategies, interestingly. So um, it's a few of the case studies that I would like to bring about through my work at TPA21 and also my own personal work through my PhD um, research that I think could unfold these kind of um, questions as well as hopefully indirectly answer uh, some of these questions. Um, so I'm really happy to discuss these uh, together with you all. So as I mentioned before that my relationship with firstly water is really important um, and therefore um, oceans also speak to me um, in a very profound way. So I really think of it in the sense of it fits under situated knowledge, which is of course coming from my own lived experience as well as entanglements uh, so the relationship between human and the non-human and multi-species. So I think it's really important to understand and hone these concepts from um, the point of view of how one's relationship can, you know, um, foster um, with the oceans, but also at the same time, how it can kind of like ground in into research work and also practical work as well. Situated knowledge comes uh, from Donna Haraway as a concept and entanglements is also a concept that has been discussed by a few philosophers. Um, um, and these are concepts that have been floating a lot in critical theory and it's been really um, interesting to navigate them from my own lens and experience. And of course, once you, um, or specifically me, I feel that there's kind of a relationship that is kind of fostering with the oceans. There's, of course, this sense of care um, and there's this sense of repair as well that um, are also concepts that, um, um, you know, on the horizon a lot and people talk about this um, in philosophy and critical theory as well and also in art. Um, that there is this sense of distance that we have with nature or specifically with the ocean, if some of us don't come from the coastal community or our relationship is, you know, um, not there in the sense of we are in landlocked place. So it could be quite tricky in order to foster a, a relationship with the ocean and to really care for it. If it's out of sight, then it's out of mind, right? So how do we care for something of a vast entity that um, is there omnipresent? Um, but at the same time, it's probably completely disconnected from us. It could be a possibility um, in the way in which we've grown up and we've lived our experiences. So there has to be ways in which we will try to approach it in ways of 
um, learning or relearning or thinking or rethinking of our relationships uh, with the oceans um, itself. So it's important to tell ourselves stories, but also share these stories. So there's a very powerful tool of storytelling that we can always um, try to feel inspired uh, by, especially when we hear storytelling to be a frame as part of indigenous communities. And specifically, I've, I've worked with uh, Pacific activists who have oceans, um, I mean, the oceans around them, um, they come from small islands in the South Pacific and they always have stories about the ocean that inspire them or, you know, they are so close to the living body that they really embody the ocean themselves as well. So it's really important to understand ourselves in the context of storytelling as a tool. And therefore, it's also really interesting um, approach when we're approaching from the lens of arts, uh, which is, you know, um, how artists are trying to navigate the space of the ocean in their artistic practices, but also how they're connecting it to social and civil movements around them um, in, in the form of activism that's also taking place around the ocean. So these are the few lenses or layers that I usually work with in my research when I try to think and approach or um, reflect on the oceans. So my specific work with TBA 21 started with um, uh, not in terms of working directly with artists and curators and mounting exhibitions, which TBA 21 does in Venice at our exhibition space called Ocean Space. Um, it actually came from a specific project on something called deep sea mining which is a critical um, issue uh, currently for uh, our uh, planetary um, existence and for all of us, regardless of where we are placed um, in the world. Deep sea mining is a specific phenomena that is something of a future phenomena. So it is speculative, it's not yet happened. As the name suggests, it's basically um, mining of minerals really in the depths of the oceans on the ocean floor beyond 4,500 meters. The minerals have um, really um, uh, um, um, different kinds of value to them because they are zinc, copper, nickel, cobalt, these kind of minerals that are important for um, alternative switch to fossil fuels. Uh, that a lot of industries and a few countries are emphasizing that we may run out of fossil fuels uh, in the near future. So we would need these minerals from the deep sea. Um, and um, the deep sea, you would think that it's probably the minerals are lying on the ocean floor, like spread out. They, they mostly are, but they have been chartered and mapped out by a UN organization called International Seabed Authority. And this um, UN organization is in charge or mandated to not only protect the high seas, which is the international area, um, or a part of the oceans, which is 40% of the oceans that is beyond any nation's jurisdiction. So the minerals have been mapped on the ocean floor outside of any nation's jurisdiction and in several pockets of the ocean that um, no nation can have access to or claim to solely or independently. So it's um, the way in which it's framed is that high seas are in control or need to be um, in control together with the nation's um, consensus. So no one nation can operate there in this area, only collectively can they operate together once they decide these things. So. Um, the way in which this works is that minerals will be mined uh, from the ocean floor and this decision needs to be made uh, by the states themselves and it's usually made by the nations themselves. So they're usually the decisions are made at the International Seabed Authority. Um, this um, UN organization is based in Jamaica, in Kingston. The reason I'm talking about this project extensively is that I um, have been representing TBA 21 um, at the um, uh, UN organization, um, representing us as a civil uh, society. 
um, and uh, amongst the nations that come there to make decisions of the way in which um, minerals can be mined. And um, they are currently formulating a legal document that kind of um, stitches the know-how um, and, and the way in which minerals can be mined from the ocean floor and how there could be little to no impact from mining, which we don't know. Science um, hasn't really you know, um, been evolved yet in the context of the deep sea because it's Im nearly impossible to research in that um, zone or area of the ocean. And so this is a, a very interesting case study because CBA 21 has had a long-standing um, relationship to the ocean in, in the context of exhibition making and research as well. But they're also interestingly involved in the UN where I represent them and I, I get to offer some legal and policy-led um, um, comments at the UN on behalf of the TBA 21. And this makes it really interesting for an art foundation, but also um, representing the civil society to have a stake in, in, in the, you know, um, uh, in framing this narrative around the deep sea um, that it needs to be protected, that we don't want mining of minerals to take place. And, and the deep sea is actually, um, um, a common heritage of humankind, um, legally speaking, which means that the global commons, um, like the space, um, like the atmosphere, um, that as we have access to it, uh, regardless of where we come from, where we are situated in the world, the deep sea also has similar kind of um, legal reasoning or access to it in this sense. So through this project, it's become really important um, for us um, as TBA 21 and for me myself to really think about um, such kind of entanglements of what is our relationship to the deep sea uh, when we haven't seen it, have no access to it. It's remote, mysterious. How does it affect coastal communities that are closer to the place uh, um, or the map um, or the area where the minerals will be mined. So it's in the Pacific Ocean and it's uh, between Hawaii and west of Mexico. Um, so, you know, how, how can these uh, communities be protected from potential mining? And um, it's a very strong narrative that I mentioned before industries are pushing at in order to um, try to frame it as, well, the deep sea, minerals better than the fossil fuel on land. And, you know, um, it's it's better to have the deep sea minerals than fossil fuels on land because it could also potentially reduce the pressure of, of um, um, labor problems or um, human rights violations that take place. Um, and so, of course, this narrative is not something that uh, many civil society um, activists, leaders, um, indigenous leaders think is, is, is the right direction. But it's really important to think of then how we need to have um, narratives that really get us closer to the deep sea in, in terms of our relationship. So um, at TBA 21, uh, we have a project called Culturing the Deep Sea. And not only do we, um, I mean, I represent TBA 21 in the UN um, in trying to frame a better law and policy narrative for the deep sea, but we also think of it in the context of awareness and education as well. So we also have a didactic online program called Ocean Uni. And we just um, currently this year realized two semesters we, we call it semester system uh, for Ocean Uni that it takes place for two, sorry, uh, th that it takes place twice a year. And um, it's in spring and fall. And um, there are totally five to six sessions where we invite speakers and um, participants can join us much like how we are here today and listen to a topic or an issue and also engage with it more and more. So we had two um, semesters of uh, the deep sea in order to really um, realize this. Um, and we did it together with um, Pacific activists, uh, Caribbean activists. So we are always also constantly working with 
global south communities as well in order to um um you know uh, give them more space in order to be able to um you know um share their knowledge with us as well so um this has been a, an important frame work as well apart from um our involvement at the un organization so um it's it's very interesting how um developments are taking place like this in terms of trying to counter narrativize extraction and exploitation that's probably possibly about to happen um in the near future which is much more challenging because neither of us don't know how it's going to look like or how it's going to be impacting the oceans themselves so that Ooh, that's um, one of the projects. Um, let me try to write. So th there are a few more pictures that I wanted to share with you in this context of um, the deep sea. Um, so you can see on the left hand side, that's the International Seabed Authority, which is the UN organization. This is where we or I regularly visit um, and um, make comments on law and policy narratives. Uh, and right beside it are the, you know, experts um, and also activists that regularly get there from other NGOs. So we have a kind of community as well in which we come together as civil society um, through NGO formations and we try to tackle this issue together with states or against states at the UN itself. So there's a lot of behind the scenes lobbying work that takes place, um, which is not that transparent to uh, the public. Um, and then we also have ceremonies as well um, in the local context. Um, um, in in um, March this year, when I was there, there was a ceremony that took place between um, Maori activists from the Pacific who came all the way from the Pacific to um, Kingston, to Jamaica. And um, it was together with Maroon um, uh, tribe, that is a local tribe in Kingston, Jamaica. Um, and it was a very beautiful ceremony of celebrating the oceans together and to really um, having this kind of like a, beautiful um, and a community exchange in order to really um, try to also make nations that are attending inside the conference hall at the UN to realize that there's a much larger civil society and community that is resisting this temptation to deep sea mine. And that is um, another picture of me, which is quite embarrassing. So I will probably <laughs> um, go to my next slide. Sorry, I'm struggling a little to yeah change slides. Um, so the other project that I'm involved with um, TBA is Rights of Nature project. Um, I don't know if um, many of you know about this or not, that there's been a huge movement on rights of nature. Um, basically, it's a legal cluster or legal tool or legal instruments um, that have been um, Percolating um, over the course of uh, many years since 2008, particularly where a lot of um, court jurisdictions, um, specifically in the global south, have started to uh, pass um, laws or policy relating to um, rights of nature. This means that nature itself can be having its own agency. And um, through representation of a guardian or guardians, um, nature has its own voice in the court of law. Um, and so there's a level of protection that can take place um, for nature, by nature and with nature. Um, and so this actually call for legal tools, instrument, whatever you would like to call it, started off in Ecuador in 2008. And then, um, you know, a lot of other nations have also been trying to adopt it in their own local uh, like local jurisdictions. So Peru and then India also uh, attempted it as well. And now it's kind of like trying to be considered, uh, trying to be considered in the context of the European framework. Um, and it's very interesting because just last year in October 2022, the Mar Menor, which is um, on the east side of Spain, um, part of the, um, uh, the Mediterranean Sea, 
um, got its own legal personhood or rights of uh, nature officially. Um, and so Mar Menor can be, legally speaking, can be represented by a local guardianship um, in the court of law in Spain. And this is one of the first movements that took place in Europe. And the reason I'm talking about this is that some of us um, through uh, different artistic NGOs, actually, TBA 21, and as well as another NGO based in the Netherlands, Embassy of the North Sea, we decided to um, get in touch with legal scholars, thinkers, activists, and trying to we are trying to think of and conceive of a confluence of European water bodies as to what that confluence looks like um, amongst us between different actors and players, um, regardless of our background and where we come from and what it looks like in terms of pushing for rights of nature or such legal instruments in the local context, um, not only like a larger European um, legal context, um, but also like specifically in the local contexts as well in different clusters of Europe. Um, and so we all came together to ask these questions um, in Spain a few months ago um, by the Mar Menor, where we collected um, different players and actors, so local activists, um, legal thinkers or, or scholars, philosophers, um, I, I, I mean, artists as well. So we all came together and we um, um, assembled by the Mar Menor, um, firstly to have a sp spiritual and a ceremonial ritualistic kind of a connection with Mar Menor, where we try to understand the local contexts of place-based struggles and activism that people took place in order to gain this legal personhood for the Mar Menor, to learn from it as a case study, and then to actually also um, in, in in exchange and to and to converse and to think about next steps as to how do we adopt this um, as well in other um, contexts as well. So um, it, it was a very beautiful and an interesting um, coming together for us. So each of us were representing a water body where or uh, we, we are close to or where we come from or where we grew up by. Um, so we had several water bodies that um, got represented um, uh, in this program. So it was uh, the North Sea, uh, the Venice Lagoon, Vistula, Rhone, Loa. I don't know if I'm pronouncing the names right, but there were some of these cluster of um, lakes and rivers, um, mainly rivers as of now, but the goal is to actually have water bodies in whatever form um, to be represented. So it was a beautiful um, collective movement that we thought in a very local context, but also in a context that could and has the potential to bloom. And next year, we will uh, also have a coming together or a gathering um, in Venice. Um, so TBA 21, we will host this um, program next year. Um, so this would be sometime around November where um, it'll be similar to what happened in Mar Menor, uh, but maybe like a 2.0 where we collect more and more people and we think of it in the context of the Venice Lagoon and how um, the Venice Lagoon could potentially be thought of as um, um, a, 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 a space or a body um, for legal protection because it hasn't, of course, happened to other water bodies yet in um in, in Europe. So it, it's very interesting to have studied this uh, at Mar Menor and to probably approach it um, to other uh, spaces as well. Um, so far, if there are no questions, I will just move on into my next slide. Um, hmm. I have no idea why I'm struggling with uh, changing the slides next, but yeah. So, um, these two other projects that I'm more involved with TBA 21 as um, a law and policy analyst and researcher. And the last project um, that I really wish to talk about, and this has been a personal project of mine, as well as it sprung from my PhD research directly. Um, 
And, and the other frame that I really wanted to mention is a decolonial approach um, that you have already started to kind of, I guess, situate or understand it within the last two contexts. But I think that the decolonial approach would be much, much more stronger um, through this project that I would really like to unfold together with you. So this uh, is actually an exhibition that I'm 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 really um, happy to share and talk about with you um, because as I said it's a very personal um, uh, connection and and an exploration and as well as um, realization of this um, project or exhibition. So it's called um, Undulating Currents, a group show. Um, I am the co-curator and my dear friend and colleague um, Brooklyn Pakati. Um, is the co-curator together with me. Uh, we made this exhibition um, together with an exhibition designer, uh, Maria Rudakova. All three of us are currently um, at the University of Applied Arts Vienna. And each of us come from different backgrounds. So I, as I've mentioned, I'm a law and policy analyst, researcher, Brooklyn has a curatorial background. They are a student um, in Transmediale, um, um, art. And uh, Maria is um, a, a graphic designer, but also an experienced exhibition designer. So um, three of us came together to think about the concept of how um, two of the most exploited extractive mate uh, uh, um, materials or like uh, or elements, um, oil and water, can be um, thought about, can be um, reframed can be um, envisioned in, in an exhibition context, especially from Black, um, queer, indigenous, and eco-feminist artists. Oil and water, the presence of the two materials or elements, um, especially in the region of Africa, there's a lot of it, but also there's a lot of exploitation, exploit, uh, um, extractivism as well in the region. And what we keep hearing about on and on from the region around the region of Africa is this exploitation, extractivist stories and narratives. But what we wanted to really search for is new ways in which we can think of or from within the materiality of oil and water in an exhibition space together with artists to counter narrativize these narratives of exploitation, extractivism. And so undulating currents, as the name suggests, um, undulating means um, non-wavering. Um, and um, the name, as it suggests, we really thought of it working from the elements or materials of oil and water. And um, the way in which the elements are, of course, there's the fluidity um, to it. There's a non-linear aspect to it. And so we really wanted to think of it in a deeper level as well, in, in the context of it being research-led. So not only it sprang from my PhD research, but also it um, uh, was research-led very strongly um, in the sense that we tried to transform the exhibition space as much as possible. So the space that you're looking at um, in front of me, um, which is the exhibition itself, the space is actually loaned to us by the University Gallery, which um, is actually rented from a local ch church um, in Vienna. Um, the exhibition opened from November 8th. So it's the last week of the exhibition now. I'm feeling extremely emotional about that, but really happy to talk about it here. Um, so in the exhibition space, you will see, and from the pictures, um, it's not the same as really coming into the exhibition space, I, I understand that, but you will see that these there are these arches and, and the floor of the exhibition as well as all of the walls were completely white, the floor um, itself were tiled, and we really thought about how, how can we think of oil and water in this very um, stringent and very um, conservative, but also like very um, dominant space because in Vienna it's located in a very prime location. Um, and so we thought of um, two concepts. Um, one was uh, blackness itself as a concept that does not mean that it represents or is representative of black uh, people, but blackness as a, as a concept to think about 
um, ways in which we can formulate our ideas and, and apply it into the exhibition space. Um, and the other is fluidity or liquidity that allowed us um, or allowed for oil and water to seep through into the exhibition. So the way in which we did it is that you can see um, in the two pictures that the um, space itself is transformed with um, a break line of black color and it spills all the way on the floor. Um, so you can see that the floor is also carpeted. And this was a curatorial decision where we felt that um, black as the color, not again representative of black art and history, but it served more as a neutrality between oil and water because we wanted to not lean on either of the materials or elements um, through the art artistic practices or the space itself but we really wanted to find a balance between the two. And the other is that the break line would allow us to think as if we are within the oceans or we are kind of in the act of submerging ourselves on the surface, but below the surface, and as well as looking into the abyss. A very strong um, philosopher um, in his book, Poetics of Relations, Edward Clasan, his name is, um, he mentioned this act of looking down or looking into the abyss as um, as as an ode or kind of a metaphor or a symbol uh, or, or a symbolic um, 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 yeah a symbolic um, connection to the African slave trade journeys that took place um, across the Atlantic Ocean and in 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 those journeys of course there were a lot of black bodies that were lost at sea submerged and now part of the cultural heritage of the oceans per se. So it was very important for us to think about new ways of displaying works of art in the space. And so this is where our second connection comes up where um, the works of art, there, there are eight of them. Uh, so as I mentioned, there are, there are eight, as I mentioned, there are black um, queer, indigenous and eco-feminist artists. So there are two, uh, sorry, there are eight of them in total, sorry. And two of them are locals and the rest of them are international. Um, none of them are students um, at the university. So they're all independent artists that we worked with. And the ways in which we try to display their work in the space is horizontal, most of them, um, of most of the works that are audio visual works, except for one sculptural work, um, are all horizontal. Again, this is the act of looking down or into the abyss or a new way of coming to think about encountering artistic practices in, in an exhibition space. So this was really important for us. What I would really like to mention, which may or may not be highlighted from the pictures, it's not easy to kind of understand it, is that one was, we really wanted to, um, um, as, as I said there, the exhibition is leaning heavily on audiovisual works. It was because of budget constraints, but also the exhibition speaks to um, the elements of oil and water and different artistic practices. So um, I think it would be helpful to talk about one specific, uh, specific work of art probably in a few minutes. And then I can just end my um, uh, talk as well. Um, so, so the three layers that we really thought about in the exhibition was one was um, the uh, visual. Uh, so that's why I kept saying audio visual, audio visual works, because we really wanted to give the sensorial uh, um, encounter to the work itself and ways in which we could display it, which is not on the walls, but horizontal um, or participatory um, as one of the works we have in the space is actually a game uh, by a game designer slash artist. Um, who is a black trans artist. Um, the second is that uh, we wanted to have a dialogical exchange. So not only between curators and artists, but also the artworks themselves together with participants. And here's when it gets quite interesting is that it's one of the few exhibitions that has books in the space. So there are books on art, uh, on black art and history in the space. So I don't know if you can see it from the picture. There is some display. I should have probably zoomed in on uh, it, but there's some display of shelves. And then there are these books that are on the shelf. So there are 50 plus books on black art and history 
that have been borrowed from the university library um, where, where we are at. And um, initially when we were searching for books specifically on black art and history in our um, university library, there were just five of them. And after we um, researched, we, we thought of more books in, uh, for the space, for the exhibition space, we raised it to 50 plus books. So the collection in, has increased now and it's also in the space, which is accessible in the space. But also after the exhibition closes this week, all the books, the collection will go back to the university library. So this is very important to mention also in the context of, well, in academia and uh, and also like the exhibition, uh, well, the, well, academia, there's so much lacking in it in, in the context of a decolonial space, but also in, 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 in decolonial knowledge. Um, and this is what the exhibition tries to counter in terms of bringing knowledge in the exhibition space, but also try to take it outside of it um, as well uh, in the form of books. And we also have texts on the on the wall like you can see some of the texts there were eight or nine texts that have been spread out so I don't know like if many of you are used to going into exhibitions usually have you have a header um, or like a large text um, somewhere as soon as you enter about the exhibition you read that and you're done with it but in this exhibition, we chopped up the texts and we kind of released it all through the uh, all through the walls of the exhibition space. So the texts are poetic and also um, it reveals our research methodology specifically. Um, and so we really also wanted to make our research led process transparent, which is not something that is um, often practiced in cultural institutions when it comes to exhibition making. So we really wanted to reveal this process of research to be transparent through these texts on the wall. So people have this joy of not only leafing through a book that they'd like to leaf through, or the option of looking at a work in a different way that's displayed. Um, as I said, like uh, in the act of looking down or horizontally, um, and, and in a horizontal form, or also the, in the joy of reading the texts on the walls that are cues or navigators to the exhibition itself in the form of um, research being revealed. So this, this was what our process was. And the third um, layer was the last layer, but not the least, was this community space that we really wanted to cultivate because in the city of Vienna, um, um, I don't know how many of you know this or not, but it's not a very diverse city. And there are, however, subcultures of BIPOC communities or queer communities, but it's not very um, prominent as such. So it was very important for us to have um, a community gathering often in the exhibition space. So we did this through quite often reading sessions with the general public, but also with BIPOC communities that led um, reading sessions um, that they chose um, from Black artists and poets and artists. And we, we collectively were in the space, discussed texts, um, talked about what we could talk about. So this became like a safe space, but also in a space, space that was already a bit disruptive, dense, and, and difficult in terms of um, it dealing with such heavy issues. So this is the way in which we really try to, um, let me just frame it this way, approach the exhibition from a deep colonial approach. And um, so far from the, from the um, passerbys, passersby or, or uh, people coming by to the exhibition, what we've heard is that they've really, um, they've really, really um, enjoyed the show so far and it's been very different for them in order to kind of like, um, yeah, navigate it as well um, than what they're used to um, in the context of other exhibitions. Sorry, I'm zoning out and zoning in just to give you more options of the pictures that we have from the exhibition. Um, so now you can see the more prominently how we try to really tackle display um, in the form of this horizontal display that I've been 
sharing with you. Um, I unfortunately don't have better pictures of the exhibition yet because we're still in the process of documenting it. But I could um, probably allow myself to share this with you that I'm probably one of the more living archival documents <laughs> that there is out there to really speak about the exhibition and to share the exhibition with you. It's a pity that it's inaccessible because of location, but um, it's 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 been it's been a it's been a great joy of my friend and I uh, my friends and I to really realize this exhibition. So you can see now from this pattern of all the three case studies that there is a huge um, leaning on how we think with the oceans or how we need to rethink with the oceans rather to foster a better and a deeper relationship with the ocean and the way in which to do it is probably your own or my experience um, and this feeling or act of care and repair and also um, how we need to find different tools, um, different ways of um, approaches to 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 really realize what we really want to realize in the context of protecting the oceans um, themselves. So um, that has been the body of my work and and kind of like my strong connection with the way in which I've been working. So I guess um, I will just look at it, the time and probably stop here. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please do let me know. Um, and I'm happy to navigate um, it further with you. Can we do questions at the end? Because yeah. we won't have any time. It's already two, uh, one o'clock. Thanks so much, Claire. Um, yeah, that was super interesting. Um, yeah, we'll go on to Jenny's presentation now. And if you have any questions for Mikla, save them until the end, as uh, both Jenny and Mikla may be able to give you um, feedback to your questions. Yes. Okay, so should I start? So, because I'm not sure about our time. Yeah. Okay. Let's share the screen. Okay, so let me, okay. Uh, so hello, thank you all for being here this evening. And thank you Alternative Europe and Bill, Billy Deep for organizing this gathering. I am an artist, I'm a researcher, I'm an educator, I'm a professor at the New School for Social Research in New York. Um, I was born and raised in Greece, but I have been living in New York since uh, the 90s, where I came to do all my studies, my art studies. Um, growing in Greece, my relationship with the water um, was always mixed. It was between caution due to contamination from plastic as well industrial and agricultural waste, but also at the same time from genuine love, appreciation and recreation because water has been always something that we have been, we had access, especially the, 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 the GNC, and we have been able to enjoy in so many different ways. My, my, my recent work, which I will nav it will navigate through water and which I will share with you today, is inspired by my great Greek heritage as well by my ongoing research, which calls for new social and ecological possibilities centered on multi-species collaboration. My research has been realized with the generous support and artist residencies with Sway Lab, an ongoing partnership with the Billion Oyster Project and the Harbor School on Governors Island in New York. I will talk a little bit more about this a little later. I create sculptural ecosystems, alternative infrastructures, and imagine futures, which I call wet gatherings and which extend from the waterways of the harbors in New York through the waters of the Aegean Sea to the Mediterranean South. My goal is to poetically interpret natural ecosystem that uplift indigenous knowledge 
and practices employ artistic and aquaculture and hydro-based ecological processes and participatory approaches from my audience and activate public spaces in ways that are resonant and impact, impactful in coastal communities globally. I believe art is a journey that emerges from intuitive experiences participatory process and speculative scenarios, which can become catalysts for communities to confront social and ecological challenges and environmental impact. I, I place a great emphasis on the body, on embodied and situated knowledge. Here the body represents an important scale of analysis of space, our closest geographies, a scale that resists the privileging of abstraction at the expense of lived experiences. Its body is both space and has its space. It produces space and is produced in space inspired by the poetry of Natalie Diaz, which I have a quote in her poem, the first water is the body from the decolonial love uh, uh, poem is an expert, forming a forms a political space for all bodies of water with, for my, from my case, oysters as protagonists. I, Natalie Diaz happens to be also a fellow in, at the new school and I have been, has been in a way my mentor from the beginning of this research. Because uh, as uh, I also am very interested, as I say, in na native through her, I became con um, a, a knowledgeable about uh, uh, native cosmologies, which are so important in my research, especially in my relationship with nature and water. So the works, I will start today with a work called Rivering. So can we go, uh, if you don't, uh, Billy, okay. Rivering is a project which was launched in the waterways of the historic Buttermilk Channel in New York Harbor at Governors Island in New York in June, 2022. Governors Island is located in the heart of the New York Harbor. It is only 800 um, yards from lower Manhattan. You take a ferry and in five minutes, almost 10 minutes, you are in, in Manhattan. Um, the, it, the, you know, it, it, and also very close to Brooklyn. Since 1966, the Governor's Island has become a New York City historic district and cultural seasonal center. The island was known as Pagan, Night Island, because from, in 19, from 1524 was there the land of the Native Americans of the Manhattan region known the Lenape. Actually where I am now, I have to give my respect because I, I am in the land of the Lenape, who use the island seasonally for fishing and to feed their animals. Rivering is inspired by the history of the water, uh, waterways of the Hudson and East River who meet in the New York Harbor before they run into Atlantic Ocean. The history is connected with the same colonial, racist, capitalist construct that they write the history of the island and the US rivers, always connected with slave trade. But, a parallel story is happening on the island while I'm doing my research and my work. And this is the story of the oyster, the native species of the New York Harbor. We all know that New York in the beginning of the century was the capital of the US, and I would say sometimes of the world, of growing oysters in, in the harbor, which was not only it was also a source of econ economic influence, but also it was a, 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 a surprisingly 
a, a way of showing that the waters in 1900 were clean and fresh and people were able to access the water. But now what is uh, what, because as we know, the oyster are not only um, improves the water quality, but also fosters new marine habitats and creates greater coastal resilience. I should note that the oyster is one of the most sustainable and self-sufficient uh, species of the water body as it, is, as it grows, it filters up to 200 liters of water a day. Oyster agriculture has been practiced for over 2000 years. And this is something that was very important for me. Uh, Billy, don't stop. I, I want to go back actually before we get here, there, there. Go one more. So, uh, so along with the scientific, scientific information on their habitats, habits and appearances, and the importance that the oysters have for the harbor of New York, I found myself attracted to the subversive and transformative lessons that we get from the oysters and the other species who are living and mothering in the rivering waters and teach us ways to survive by understanding ourselves as part of nature, as part of water. The oysters is a form of life that has so much to teach us about vulnerability, collaboration, and adaptation in order to be with change, especially since one of the major changes we are living through is causing and shaping our climate crisis is the rising of oceans, drought, and non-access to clean water. And although the words are different across many languages and lands, the ache of thirst and access to clean water translates to all bodies along with the same paths and the body, the tongue, the throat, the kidneys, the breath, no matter what language we speak, no matter what color of our skin. So rivering, can you go now next? The next, okay. So rivering is a floating aquatic ecosystem of navigational markers built entirely from salvage material found on the island, which as, one more, can we go? Um, so, uh, uh, which they are adorned, uh, some of them with cameras. What the, 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 this involving design project, it was realized in close collaboration with young students from the Harbor School and the marine biologists of the Billion Oyster Projects on Governors Island. The Harbor School is the only school in the US which is based on Governors Island in which the students learn everything that has to do with water. They, they become from scientific, biological, artistic, engineering approach is an incredible school, an amazing group of uh, uh, young people which come from all different economic backgrounds and from all over, from all the boroughs of New York. And working with the, the Billion Oyster Project, which is a very well-known project now, worldwide, I would say, is a project that they 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 try to re, re, relieve of the, the the idea of cleaning the water of New York, which is not accessible. And actually, this project, one of the main ideas was to create those markers, which not only gives us accessibility to the water, but also map and collect data from different parts of the water, especially from the this channel, the Buttermilk Channel, which is known from the, from the, the, the name is still the same name that the Lenapa were using. And it was called Buttermilk because through there, they were taking their animals from Governors Island to Brooklyn. Because then at that time, the water was so low that you can walk from the island to Manhattan and from the island to Brooklyn. Uh, 
So what was interesting with these markers, which I actually I was inspired from the lives and the habitats of the of the oysters, was where to and, and as we know the the oysters they are very sensible to, to the sound. So when the the, the New York uh, uh, Harbor is extremely noisy and extremely busy. And not only is very polluted, but at the same time, it's not the best environment to grow oysters because, as as I say, they are very sensible to this uh, to to the, the to the water sounds. So our idea was to map those areas that to find out how the the oysters react into these uh, sounds, but also to the mobility and the continuous flow of the water. But also, the rivering also, what was helping was another, as we know, uh, New York uh, is a very, uh, has a very hard coast coast. First of all, we, it's all, all uh, if you go to Manhattan, if you go to, to, to Governor's Island, what I was surprised, it's all fenced. The, you, you never have accessibility to the water. Can you go one one side, slide? This is my studio in uh, on the island, and he's, this is the first marker that we created with the students. And then we go down one more. And there is a, I show how we worked with the students. This is one one group of the from the students from the Harbor School. Uh, you go one more. And this is one thing we I decided to do with also the the support of the of the uh, of the harbor and uh, the people of the harbor because it's, as you know it's very hard and very difficult to get permission. This was actually the first art project that was allowed to be in the water of the harbor. We we also built this boat, which we built this boat in our studio. On, on, on Governor's Island, what we so for this way we allowed we were taking the audience, the people, the visitors into these rides through the project. So in other words, they have a very close connection with the water and with the work, and also which allowed, to my opinion, this immersion of the body into the water that otherwise someone who is visiting the island or is in Manhattan would be very difficult to have this kind of experience. So I want to say also, uh, it was we were very, very careful about all the material. I, I actually, the underwater portions of the project uh, are very carefully considered as the visible part and include oyster lines and bi biophilic anchors. Because it is a whole, I, I would never be able to do this project without the support of the of the Harbor School, and and, and especially the, the 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 knowledge that they shared with me about doing this. Because to anchor uh, the floating systems in a harbor, which is so busy, is quite an an, an event by itself. Um, we are continuing monitoring the waters, and uh, what uh, and I, I also rivering has helped soften the city's hard coastal edges and create tools for other ways to experience and engage with water in a city, which, as I say, there is no access to clean water, and the coastline is always concrete, stones, and steel. So would you go a little bit more? So this is what was interesting in this process is that I also learned so much to use tools because many of the students were young girls, which I was at the beginning very impressed by the way we were they were building. And so it's in the way it was a motivation for me to learn hands-on skills. Um, and let's go one more. And here is our studio in on the island, uh, in which allows us of also we have all the tools and all the, the the guidance to continue to work on this project. Actually, the project is still live, 
And actually the wet gatherings is a project that it keeps going. And I hope this spring we are going to create another uh, intervention on the island. And, uh, and we are planning a series of readings and poetry readings actually and fiction, taking people on the boat that we, we uh, uh, built in, in this studio. Um, so let's go. This is my team. Like this is my uh, team uh, uh, of the, the I would say the grown ups from Billion Oyster Project, and the the other is my young team of uh, my students that we work together in realizing th this. Uh, there is a film which is on tube, in which is a film about the whole project because I can spend hours just to show you how the installation. Just in the, the installation of these floating systems in the water, it took us two days. It took us two, two boats. I mean, it was a whole adventure, but a beautiful adventure because it created community. It created th this collective process of, of making, of sharing, of addressing issues that we, were, we are all very concerned, which is about clean water in our city access to clean water uh, and being able to, to, to put our bodies in these waters. So I will go now to the next project. Uh, here is, as I say about that here, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing some images of the oysters, which has become my medium. And uh, I'm going to the next project, which is the Hatchery Lab, the House of Challenging Orders, which took place in Vienna last uh, November in 2022. The hatchery we, with the invite and the sponsorship of Vienna Art Week, I, was, I went to Vienna in November 2022 to create a project with the theme, the House of Challenging Orders, which wanted to look at the political, social, and cultural status quo from different artistic perspectives. Drawing on my interdisciplinary methodologies and indigenous storytelling and speculative design and fictions, I consider the role of the oysters as a precious resource capable of reversing the course of ecological devastation and water pollution. The hatchery and aquatic club was created always taking in consideration the limitations of working in a closed environment or in one room. The hatchery is my tactile response to the climate crisis. The installation resembles a man-made oyster reef. Can you go one more? One more? Here. A man-made a man, a man oyster reef, which is made out of lime, mixed with crushed dead oyster shells and sea sand, which creates a live cement known as tabi. Tabi is a uh, known for, is a very known, old known material, which actually I, I happen to learn a lot by my relationship with, a contemp with my contemporary uh, exchanges that I have with the, the small community of Lenape, who still live in a small town in Long Island City. The installation is colored with lapis lazuli, the ultramarine pigment formed through the contact of metamorph metamorphism of dolomatic limestone. The hatchery is also adorned with artificial oyster model with 3D technology and made out of tabby. Tabi is an essential material who has been used from indigenous since antiquity, creating habitats and underwater infrastructure, but also stabilizes pH levels in the ocean and locks CO2 into the, the ocean floor. The hatchery mirrors various facets of native ecologies, as well as the oyster's nature, which exemplify growth, accumulation, care, rebirth, rehabilitation, capturing the dynamic essence of oyster in its myriad forms. I was hoping that the hatchery 
in this space will indicate that the work came from the ocean and it is in it, its way back to the waters. And of course, being in Vienna, the only water I would think of was the Danube River. So along with the installation, one more, one more, one more. At Hall with Installation, I organized a series of workshops which allowed the audience to intervene and use the material from the installation to create their own reefs. It also, this, it allowed to create a sensory experience. And because as we see, the, the shape of the installation continues changes. And this way, I wanted also to make a metaphor about the ecological, as a ecological parallel, how the humans meet nature and how we must be mindful of nature because how, how fragile it is. So the, one more. So one of the ideas, as you see here, I show, I juxtapose the, the, the uh, what we the three D uh, oyster with uh, uh, real uh, uh, oysters. So one more. So uh, uh, it, in closing with this, what I wanted to say is because I felt the the project was in a very I would say commercial art environment, and I would say it was from the only project that allow the the the, the audience the visitors to interact. So at the end also I had I had instructions and I had bags and I allow each of the uh, people of the of the audience to take material with, so the whole idea is as I said to transport this installation into the water of the river of in, in Vienna so it will be like our gift and as a metaphor about how we how we can do something about the water. Because as I understood from my research, uh, the river went through a lot of um, phases. And right now, you know, uh, people, it has been cleaned and it's going to be, and, and people are using it for recreation, etc. So anyway, uh, I want to go, so we have time for the discussion and, I want to go to my third project, which is Futuring Waters, is a, 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 a still ongoing actually project. Uh, the, the, the title is Futuring Waters, a speculative manifesto from and for the right of water, which was commissioned by Elefsina, Cultural Capital of Europe 2023. Um, one of the things I want to say is that invited by Elefsina Cultural of, of Europe and bringing my long-term artistic research to bear on the coastal ancient city of Elefsina, known and being one of the most prominent sanctuaries of the ancient world, identified with the worship of Dimitra, goddess of agriculture, and her daughter Persephone. And on the other hand, the recent history of Elefsina, known for its human-led environmental destruction and biodiversity loss, no access to clean water due to heavy industries that took over the coast and resulted in the most polluted water and breathing air in Greece. So bringing my research in a project like this, as I had a number of critical questions that I, had, that I felt had to be raised. I had to address and respond to the complex history of the topos of the place of Erifsina. How can I move? from the place of imagination into the urgent space of climate action and advocacy.
How can I design for and with the water? What are the implications of recognizing water as an active agent capable of authoring and defending its universal rights? How can institutions, and especially how two years initiative, like a city capital of Europe, become custodians and act in reciprocity with their surroundings? And what about the polluted water in Elefsina? I decided that the project should unfold in the course of one year and will manifest itself first through a series of workshops, second, by me building a floating sculptural ecosystem made out of tabi, which will be placed in the most polluted waters of Elefsina, third, an exhibition, and it will conclude, and this was one of my major projects with the publication titled Futuring Waters, a speculative manifesto for and from the waters of Elefsina. As you understand, to undertake a project like this, I had to work from the bottom up. I, I spent almost a, a year in research. I tried, I met with the citizens of Elefsina, especially environmental activists, which unfortunately is a very small group in the, when some someone um, thinks the importance of the issue, uh, because as I said before, the the the, the industries that they took over the uh, uh, the city are very important. They bring a lot of money to the community, so there is a conflict there between fresh air, clean water, and an economy. So. Um, I would like to talk now about how I, I uh, uh, how I built this project because it was really like I was building. Um, that's how I felt. Uh, it was like 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 a huge structure of of ideas, thoughts, events, actions, uh, uh, interviews, responsibilities, economies. Uh, energies that I had to put together. So the workshops, as I said, I decided to start with workshops. That The workshops took place in the course of two months, from May through June, 2023. And I decided to, to invite and bring together Greek international curators, artists, poets, marine biologists, activists, architects, lawyers, and local youth. I believe very much, and as you see along my in, through my work, I'm, I I always try to create very close relationships and collaborations with young people. With their diverse expertise and knowledge, are addressing the implications and recognizing water as an active agent capable of authoring a defending its universal rights. The workshops were curated by me in collaboration with Eleni Riga. Eleni Riga is a Greek curator who also deals with, in her work, in her curatorial practice, she also deals with the water commons. As a collective exercise, taking up the legacy of radical art pedagogy to produce new vocabularies for learning, speculative design, and environmental advocacy. I wanted collectively to explore and reflect on the recent trends in the blue humanity and watery research always with focus on the case study of Elefsina. The hands-on workshop invited participants to expand and experiment with how speculative fiction can blend with personal stories to develop ways we co-author our story our timelines of everyday lived experience of climate change. Narrating the climate crisis is multifaceted. It can describe our experiences in various time scales through real and imaginary places and with multi-species characters. So can we go a little bit? 
So I will go. So this is a map that we created during one of the workshops about Elefsina, trying to, as you see, to find the places, trying to find out species that still survive the pollution, but also to to connect to to indicate where all these uh, industries are, and especially this area of Liha, which I will talk a little bit more, which is called, um, Vlicha is one of the most polluted uh, water sea areas of the, of the coastal city, and which still is known as the cemetery of boats, because on, on the top of, of the industrial pollution, they allowed all the all boats that they were out of service to go and be anchored on this on this place. So as we understand, it creates an additional pollution and an additional uh, disruption of the species that they cannot survive in these waters. One more. And this is an example of the boats that are just anchored on the on the on the coast and nobody's taking care, another, that's another example. And this is the Vlicha, this is a good example, a good image of Vlicha, how the waters is now. And actually this is a photo in a good day because some days this is full of, of uh, waste. So, so one more. So this is the first, I will just go, I, also all my workshops are online. So we have, I have documented, so you are very welcome to see them. So I will just go by the, the title of each workshop. The first, we started with the eco-feminist eco aquapoetics, which was led in, I, I, we did this in collaboration with Blanca de la Torre. Blanca de la Torre is a Spanish curator who uh, her, she's focused fully on curating projects with an uh, ecological and environmental concerns. Uh, next. Uh, uh, one, this is part of the, pro one, one more image before. Uh, also as part of this project, uh, we also invited the women from, the, um, from Elefsina and, and we, we had a, a soccer, we created a soccer team, which we, it was a kind of a ritual and kind of a sharing. So we start sharing with the feminist community through a soccer game. So, I mean, we, we, we try to do workshops which connected us with the water, but also connected us with our identity and also giving us, uh, our, uh, especially for the local women, that was very important to find ways of connectivity, but also we wanted to do it in ways that they were more unexpected, they were fun, and they were challenging too, because always when we talk about soccer, we never th think about women's soccer team. So creating a soccer, a, a, an ambiguous soccer team next to the water was, and then losing our balls into the water was a very interesting experience. So go, go on, one more. This is another uh, um, uh, um, ritual that uh, the participants came up uh, and uh, they created during the workshop about uh, uh, body and the water ago. Um, so this is another uh, uh, workshop called uh, um, Re Reclaim the Myth. This was a project that Eleni Riga and myself did, and we tried to recreate a ritual about uh, which took place in antiquity, in which way people, uh, in order, if there, there was no rain, they had, a, they were taking place, a, a ritual was taking place in which they had these long uh, containers and they were putting seeds because Dimitra was very much connected, the goddess Dimitra connected with agriculture and seeds. So they were shaking, though they were uh, dancing and shaking those containers to call for rain. So we, we decided to do this project with young kids, 
with younger kids. And instead of seeds, we used beans and lentils, which is, is also a kind of food that doesn't require a lot of water to grow. So we created this uh, kind of containers during the workshop. Next. Um, and just a note to say, if we could move on to the questions soon, I think that would be okay. great. So, so I will go to the, the, the next is, 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 can we go through? Those are part of the uh, workshops with titles of, I mean, there are so many. Um, this is our space, which was next to the water. This is Julia uh, Strauss that did a beautiful project, a beautiful uh, um, a workshop with the title. Uh, rituals of environmental grief. And then we did this beautiful uh, 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 panel, Constructing Futures was another workshop that we did a, uh, an assembly and we invited the whole community to share and address the issues that they have about the water. Go on. This is part. Then is that uh, um, I did another workshop with a community and, and they suggested what kind of uh, uh, sculptural ecosystem they would like to do in order to pause it, to share them with and put them in the water as we did, as you see here. This is the, and this is the, 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 the uh, I, as I say, I wanted also to do a, there was this uh, a kind of um, exhibition but for me, the exhibition was not, I didn't see the exhibition as it was more a piling set of what happened during the workshops. And so as you see, and here is the, the moment, the ritual in order to put with what we did into the polluted water. And so this is another uh, reef that I created with the same material out of dead oysters, which actually I found out that they have the same oysters in, in a small village, coastal village, not far from Elefsina. And also I, I, we found out that they were using this. And Future in Waters, what I want to end is with a book, which was to me very important because the book was is not a catalog of the project. The catalog, and I want to talk a little bit, please give me this time about the book because the book is um, a work that I, I created with the, the local citizens of Elefsina. And um, was to act, it's a collect, taking up the legacy of radical, again, art pedagogy to produce new vocabularies of learning, speculative design and tools, but very important to make visible the voice of the local community in addressing the rights of water through a collective manifesto. So the speculative manifesto seeks to destabilize human-driven research inquiries, focusing in the poetics of fluidity and co collaborative knowledge production. I must add that addressing the complexity of water relations and rights, it demands as articulated by Siperic and Wade, the C demands approaches from wide ranging disciplines. So what happened with this book is not, I, I invited, it was a generative knowledge book. So everybody who, who participated in the, in the, during the workshops, I invited to write and reflect about water. But the most important, go, can you move? Is that I, I with the, this, this is the book, I can, can you click? I can take it. And um, so this is our manifesto, which starts from the proposal for a world water law. We citizens of Earth call for four and commit to working together to ensure that the binding international law is put in place for the immediate and universal protection of all water as the first vital step towards global cooperation for effect Effect, effective worldwide social and ecological healing. So can you go a little bit more? So this is the manifesto, which I wrote with the citizens of Elefsina. And our plan is because one of the, my, my participants during the workshop is Dr. Skoulos, which is the representative of Mediterranean and the South in the UN 
during the water week. So our plan is, can you move a little bit? This is our manifesto. Unfortunately, we don't have time to read, but it's a, I can show you in the book. I can, it's available in the book. And our plan is during the water week in, U, in New York, we are going to submit this manifesto, which articulates the rights of water of Elefsina and the rights of species of Elefsina as have been articulated in collaboration with lawyers, uh, activists, uh, plain citizens of Elefsina about the, the for and from the water of Elefsina. Do you mind going through just a little bit of, of the book? It's five, it's three seconds. Would you go back to where the book is? So I want the people to have it because can you click on the book? If if you click on the book, the, the, there is a small a, a short trailer to show how this um, also the visuals and the drawings and everything that was part of this uh, project. I'm afraid I don't have access to okay. the. Okay, okay, that, that's okay. So uh, let's open into questions because, as I say, I can talk for hours about these projects because they are very complex. They require a lot of, as you see, the, the uh, process, collaborations, a lot of research, and a lot of uh, organizing, I would say. So the, 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 the artist becomes everything. Thanks so much. Jenny. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Both of you. Um, so yeah, opening up to questions now. Um, I have one in mind already, so I might start and then other people can go ahead. Um, so both of you have done work linked to water rights and representing water. And I'm, I'm thinking about how um, Mikla, you mentioned the Marmanor Lagoon, who is the which is the first water body in Europe to be given some form of personhood, right? Legal status. Yeah. Um, and I'm also thinking about how you've mentioned Jenny similar intentions. Um, and in a very practical sense, what has been your um ways in thinking about how to actually represent a water body um, or part of nature. And I'm thinking this too, because we do quite a lot of work around citizen assemblies and we're thinking of how to involve like an element of water in a citizen assembly, but how do you speak for water? Um, uh, for me was a, a huge question because um, there is always the question, how do I have the rights? who has the rights to represent the water or the nature. Um, but I think uh, what, uh, from my experience, also working and learning from the Lenape and uh, native uh, people in, in the US, as you know, which also they, they thrive in addressing the issue. And actually, as we know, some in some areas, they have already been able to get rights for the rivers and the waters. Um, so they helped me very much in how to go and working with a community and letting the community lay down the, the what they felt, the, they sh how they should address and uh, articulate the right of their water. Of course, we are talking a very site-specific water. So because the location has been so problematic, and has so it was very, to my opinion, was not very hard if you read the manifesto, which actually we we address it as we, and and not I or the name. So we as we put, so we give the we allow the water to talk. So the manifesto is not anymore is not the people of Elefsina that they talk on the manifesto but we put we including the voice of the water. So the whole manifesto is like we allowed the water to talk and say from the experience of all these years till now, what 
it is is looking for its rights and how it will gain these rights what it sh should happen in order to to have clean water so th this is how i went about i i worked with uh, activists but i worked also with lawyers in order to find the right glossary to, you know to write but also i we we all decided that, that we'll give the that the water will become we, you know, it will be part of we, the water and the spaces, because I believe very much in this interconnectivity. My, my relationship with the Oyster Project has taught me so much about how uh, we should, the, we cannot talk about the water without collaborating with the, the, the water species. The, 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 we can't, I mean, we are so uh, infused by the, the, the idea of the Anthropocene that everything in centers in the human that we tend to, to forget everything, every, every, everything else, you know? So I don't think you can talk about the water without letting the, the species of the water talk about themselves. So for me, I'm, I'm tending to bring everything into the non-human. So when I talk about community, for me, my community is not only the human, is and the non-human. And Mikla, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I think Jenny really laid it out really well that firstly, we do need to think about uh, or with multi-species and from a very non-human perspective, if that makes any sense. But um, I personally, and this is just my personal of opinion, I feel that I think there is a lot for us to learn from indigenous communities across the globe. Uh, they have had a very close and intimate relationship with nature. They um, have such a mutual respectful relationship that it has spanned over centuries, right? And because of the way in which colonialism has manifested and grabbed their lands and also water bodies, it has left them feeling displaced. And I think that first for, for in my opinion, um, I think it's really important to um, make space for those indigenous communities to feel that they can rekindle their relationship or they can rekindle it from centuries ago and also continue to do so and also the future generations. Um, and maybe there's a chance for us to also learn from them um, significantly um, and informing our own relationship with water um, bodies or nature itself. And I think this is something that um, is less often um, talked about and also discussed. Um, and it, it also is, um, yeah, speaking from this very decolonial uh, motive and like decolonial, decolonial approach itself. Um, and, and I think this, this hasn't been fixed um, even in contemporary times. So um, I also kind of like contrasted and imagined it with the, one of the case studies that I was talking about earlier, the confluence of European water bodies. I'm part of it, but I often wonder what that means to me um, as well, because I am not European, I'm not white, and I'm not, um, uh, I don't have like a natural relationship um, in the form of like the citizenship or nationhood. Um, um, and and then I question often like, where do I belong? And, and, and uh, what is belonging to me um, in the form of nature or water body that I didn't grow up with? Um, and how can I, you know, move beyond this frame of nationhood, um, citizenship and and borders or territories and really like connect but, with but it. can I jump in, in this? Yeah, but please. this is the whole idea though, that uh, I believe that when we talk about uh, identity mm. uh, uh, and, and water, I think w w we experience a liquidity of identity. It doesn't matter where we are or who mm. we are my opinion because can i, I jump in into this please yes, as a yes, representative yes, as a representative of the indigenous community of the mari yes. um it is just simply i think that what my my color was saying is that there is not enough acknowledgement hmm. of the root of the inspiration of the environmental personhood because 
it is important to mention when one is writing this law that the perception of us humans as a part of the entire system and as a part of the sacred organism is um, derived from the indigenous communities. I think it's very crucial and I think this is what were, was pointed at, at this note, which I'm really very grateful for because I feel um, discrimination exactly in regard to uh, the attempts of establishing environmental personhood. And I'm trying to establish environmental personhood for the Academia Platonos garden in Athens for quite a long time. And it's very difficult to develop a discussion with lawyers who take us uh, not seriously because they think we are some strange echo feminists who just propose something absolutely crazy. And even mentioning the existing laws of uh, protection of um, natural environments as persons doesn't help. So what I would like to ask to you both, I guess, is um, we have 150 gods. And among those gods, there are a lot of different, different kinds of gods, and they are related to different elements. So I'm wondering, you know, if deep mining of the ocean happens actually out of the earth, why does this law not include the forest, the air, and the, the core of the living zone of um, Mother Earth? And also, there are already laws that protect Mother Earth as mm -hmm. the whole. And I think we have to be a little bit, I mean, I'm absolutely into the ocean. I also come from a big river. And I also love to unleash the river underlying the garden in Athens. But I really wonder whether it would be a little bit more focused on only one element of four crucial elements, if we just talk about water. And I think we do have to talk about water, but I think we also should be in balance with all other elements and introduce some universal law of both earth, air, the entire ecosystem of all living. And we have to connect somehow them all together because we have written one also. It's a paragraph zero. It's also a law which I wrote together with different, different people from different indigenous communities. And mm -hmm. we also have a draft of a universal law for a personhood of Mother Earth. I think we have to create one big one. Mm. Uh, can I say something, yeah. Julie? I think when uh, when we talk about what you said, it may, of course, it, 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 it should be this way, but you cannot talk about the water without talking about the land. You cannot, and this is what I go back and, you know, for me living in this country, I, 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 I get a lot of, I, I, I outsource knowledge from native. Uh, we are, who, who they still uh, appropriate a lot of their cosmologies and their knowledge. But I also, if we work in a place like Greece, because you bring the, 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 the good example of Academia Platonos, we also have to, to take in consideration how, what it means, this, this cosmology or native knowledge for, for the Greek people, for the Greek citizen. So I think maybe sometimes we should also try to outsource some knowledge between water and earth, as you said, and all this uh, human human and non-human connectivity, but also we have to take in consideration the site specificity and, and this uh, knowledge produced from the place that we are working from. That's, I mean, I cannot be totally, when I'm, I'm a, a, in New York or when I'm in Vienna, where I'm in Senegal, I have also to learn from the local cosmology because when I was talking in Elefsina about uh, Natalie Diaz, some of the Elefsinians didn't know. But if you go back into the antiquity and you start finding common uh, connections, connectivity, how it was, how and in antiquity, actually, Elefsin, as you know, had the most important aqueduct in, in, 
in, in Europe. And it is a place where it has the, the, the most polluted and, and not access to water. The, uh, the, 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 uh, people cannot go swimming. They cannot go farther than 10 meters because their, the, the, their water is also owned by the military. So we have to address a lot of issues when we work in, 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 in depending on the place. And I want to say it's amazing your project in Academia Platonos, but you have to get the support of the local people too. That's my, I mean, you have to bring this, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the rights of everything has to represent the rights also of the people or not, not the people of everybody taking in consideration the place or the site, the site specificity. Oh yes, we are not alien to the place. We are with the assembly of Colonos, of course. Of yes. course, of course. I yes. also just wanted to add to what Jenny said, but um, instead of offering a solution, it's more like a critique. Um, and I come from a law background, so I can, I mean, as much as also you would know that there's, as I said, I was pointing out to there's lack of space for indigenous people, but also in law, um, the law, the way in which it operate, uh, operates currently and also from colonization times is, has always treated land, water as, you know, in possession on ownership and also to create zonals, um, um, sorry, zonals and also territories on nature in order to perpetuate this ownership and possession. So it's not really giving space to indigenous people and the way in which indigenous people have tools and approaches to to really like protect nature or 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 specifically their land or water and because there's never been space given to indigenous people their um stories or the way in which they form community uh, or protect their land or water has never infiltrated in law as well so law as a tool is also a col colonial tool uh, that has been used to, you know, regulate not only land water, but also indigenous communities as well that it's tried to own and possess as well. So it, I think a longstanding um, problem and as well as a longstanding solution would be to really uh, try to think in the way in which we can approach, reorganize ourselves um, and also like through the tool of law that has the ability to change um, from olden times to present times, it's it's not static. It's something that needs to uh, continuously uh, need to evolve. So um, I, and the aqua politics. Sorry, um, there is a, a one of the a, a, one of the a, a workshops we did was totally about aqua politics. What it means if all our laws are based on on water laws. Because everything is based on, yeah, something that we can own, we can stand on, because we feel more comfortable. So what about creating a st uh, laws that they are all connected with uh, uh, what we call them is, was aqua politics. Mm -hmm. So we have come up with new laws that mm -hmm. they take in consideration a liquid, a, a, a liquid uh, state, a liquid uh, um, idea that... Uh, so it's not so de depending on this, as you said very well, on colonial ideas and thoughts that we continue to perpetuate. And that's why we were calling it the Anthropocene, you know? So mm -hmm. why not to come up, and this is what is our, our agent, is our um, work to do to bring change and how do you bring change by trying to change the laws hmm. and, and 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 i think this is something that we should discuss deeper and further because without changing the law we can, we are perpetuating the his master's voice correct yeah, absolutely. And because there's lack of space or laws itself that have been formulated according to indigenous communities haven't come forefront. And if they did, things or world would look super different, you know, than what we have um, currently and also like in history. But we should start from, from very small uh, uh, topos, from many small uh, 
project, you know, you, you, you start small and then you expand. And this is something we are trying to do very well with, uh, I mean, and, and, and Natalie Diaz is working towards this and Alexis Gums is working towards this. You know, there is a lot also of thinkers here in, in the US that we work with these ideas that how we are going, how can we change laws? How, because everything is everything is about it has been erased. It's not that the natives that just they don't have voice. They have tried to erase everything, and and this is one of the biggest problems. Yeah. So when we, everything has been erased, we start to to work from zero. But working from zero, and and all the, with these amazing cosmologies and knowledge that they carry with them. And and people that they work with it, we, we can create new. And, and and I don't think it's a utopia, it's it's just a way of thinking and acting and creating agency. I I I believe this because you know I have been I I can talk for hours the difficulties and Julia knows, I went through working in a small town in Elefsina in Greece and 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 addressing people issues like this. That they don't want to address. They don't. They don't. But still, at the end, I found out that there was so much response and much, you know, need, and you know, to to bring a voice, to bring to make visible. And I think, as you said, we have to change the laws. And this is, to my opinion, something that we are working on. We continue to work with right now. Thanks. Yeah, and also the structures that systemically exclude um, different people um, as well. That is also that we need to really. We are still here. Exactly. Yeah. It's not zero. We are still here. It's not a yes, zero. Yes, we, we are always amazing and always. So, Academia Platonus is a good example and a good to, to start something, you know, or, or propose. You know, just as a proposition to come up with. It really looks like she's concerned. <laughs> she <laughs> looks like she really wants to say something. So <laughs> I was looking at no, her. No, I should not talk because no, really, really it's not my talk. So it's not I'm afraid. just aware that we're getting close to eight o'clock now. Um, and so I'm wondering if anyone else um, that's here has any questions to ask. Um, now is your chance. <laughs> Julie, yeah. Ah, okay, sorry, I've been listening and also remembering because I realized that I was at um, I was at Jenny's workshop because I was in Elefsina for um, Culture Action Europe. I'm on the board of Culture Action Europe and I was a member of European Parliament. But oh. I came to this session because, so I'm really a poet and a theater maker and I realized that um, exactly what Jenny just said is that we have to change laws. And so I ended up putting myself into a political space where I became a co-legislator. So I'm British, so you realize I'm not doing that anymore because uh, of the disaster of Brexit. Um, but anyway, Jenny, I should send you the photos that I took of the workshop because I oh, had a little look. I had a little look at them and and realized, you know, it was so wonderful to really, to be at this session and then realize that I'd been in your workshop. Um, uh, so it's not that I have questions, but I have three bits of really important information that I think people on this seminar, on this webinar might appreciate and want to do something with. And um, one of them is there is an amazing network called, um, Oceans Partnership, which is bringing together academics, artists, um, uh, people interested in the oceans and in the health of the oceans and in what we can do and kind to trying to get rid of that um, uh, that uh, false division really between science and the arts, which I think has been really well um, well explained today. Um, you, you, because you cross those barriers, you're you're working in all those spheres. So I'm going to put these in this information in the chat because I think um, oh, they do speed dating uh, once a month, and it's I've been doing it for a few months, and I absolutely love it. I've met some amazing people, 
and initially I was really scared about being in that space because I'm a poet really and latterly was a policy maker and a a lawmaker but really I'm still a I'm still an artist um but all the people in that space have been really welcoming of artists and I think it would be great to see lots of you in that space so I'll put a link to that also I'm working with um a social movement called Culture Declares Emergency, uh, which began as a British um, kind of call to arms to, for the cultural sector, but is now working uh, internationally. And again, everybody on this call sh could be part of that movement. And there are hubs um, springing up in different parts um, of the world. And in fact, one of them is in Australia and is working with indigenous people. So Julia, the things that you said, I think are really, really important. So I'll put a link to that in the chat. And then the third thing um, is that I did a course this summer with an organization called Solutions Journalism Network, which is about trying to write about, and it was all about water. That's so it was all about water and oceans and solutions journalism is an absolutely fantastic new um, kind of way of um, bot really people at the people at, at the grassroots who are grappling with all these things, actually getting their stories and their suggestions for solutions into in, into the media and published. And so again, and they and they they're, they provide loads of opportunities for people who are not in the mainstream and people who are excluded. So I didn't have any questions, but I felt that those three things are really super interesting and important and maybe relevant for the people on this session today. So, but it's been brilliant to listen. It's been really, really fantastic. So I'm just gonna put, what, I'll put those things in the chat for you. Um, Thank you, I'm Julia. Thank really you happy. You know, really happy for people to contact me in the future as well. So I'm still so trying to work well, within. You put your email as well. Mm -hmm. I will. Yeah. So that would be nice. Thank you. And thank you. I think actually I have your, you should send me the photos. Thanks so much for that contribution, Julie. I've also noted down everything. Um, yeah. Wondering if there's right, anyone else um, who's that. still, wondering if there's anyone else who still has questions or if we're gonna close here as it has been the two hours. I take the silence as no more questions. So thanks again to our amazing speakers, Mikla and Jenny. And thank thanks you. everyone for being here. Thank you so much, Billy, for organizing it. And thank you, Jenny, for your presentation. It was amazing. And thank, thank you. And thank you. It was nice to, to know about more about your work and see you talking about the work. It's very different than looking into uh, the photos. And congratulations for the exhibit and good luck. Thank you so much. You and so I'll much. see you when I come in Vienna, if you are in yes, Vienna. I am. I will be. And please visit me. And okay. all day, everyone. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Julia. It was amazing to hear from you as well. Uh, Mikhala, I've missed your exhibition. I didn't know about it. I was in Vienna and nobody ah. told me about it. And I'm writing a PhD called Trans-Indigenous Epistemologies and Ecofeminist Practices in Vienna. And nobody mm -hmm. told me about your exhibition. And I take it as an example of what you said before you introduced the exhibition. <laughs> I think you know, we also weren't very commercial with it as well. But yeah, that is true. It's it's um, it's a very wide space, Vienna. Sorry to uh, say that, but yeah, it's, it's a fact. <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much, Julia. I'm sorry that... Um, I mean, it's the last week. Um, it closes on twenty third. I wish I could have, kind of, you know, like. But maybe I prolonged it. But hopefully, in the future, with more exhibitions. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations to everybody. Thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you oh, so much. Oh, thank Jenny. you. Thank you so much, Julia. Nice Power. to see you. And I'll Good. see you in January. I, I'm going to Athens to present the book so i hope you are in athens yes the book presentation it will yes. be a bright moment for sure yes 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 so we will talk about this
Okay. Yeah, great. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.